tenor or bass trombone? What do you enjoy more? Tenor. I don't really play bass. I play bass if I'm employed to play bass uh, trombone. I will for sure. But generally speaking, I am a tenor trombone player. Bass trombone is like kind of like a, an Achilles heel almost. It's kind of like a, a weakness, you know, definitely a weakness. But um, it's super important to be able to double in terms of being employed. If you want to be employed as a trombonist, it's a good idea to be able to double on uh even on tuba too, not just on uh, bass trombone. Does it matter that you add more color to a piece or more technicality to a piece? By color, I'm assuming that you mean, maybe I'm wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming you mean like personality by that or like um, interpretation. And I would say that What's more important is that part. The music part is the most important part. The connecting with people is the most important part. So that's the music part to me. Um, being technically proficient is super important to develop clarity and to be able to clearly express your ideas. And that's how I kind of talk about it. Being able to clearly express your ideas is like clarity. And um, clarity, and it comes from articulation, it comes from sound being able to freely express yourself, you know? And so that comes from the technical side, right? And so leveling up your technical side, then leveling up your musicianship at the same time, it's super important. Kind of one builds on the other, build on the other, build on the other, build on the other. So as you progress technically, your foundational skills as a musician need to improve. As your musicianship improves, your technique then needs to improve in order to keep up, you know? So they both help one another. And they both speak to one another and they both um, reinforce one another, I guess I would say. So they're both good and they're both uh, both important parts of developing as a musician and developing a piece or how you play a piece. What would be a good solo to play or choir piece for trombone? A good solo to play in terms of jazz trombone repertoire or a good solo to play as a transcription? A good solo to play? There's so many things that's so contextual to what the situation is. Um, in terms of, I'll talk about a couple of pieces that I like. Um, trombone choir. Oh, trombone choir piece. I always liked playing Bach for in trombone choir. So when I um, went to Eastman, East, Eastman School of Music for my undergrad, we played, uh, we played a, lo a lot, not a lot, but a good amount of Bach. My favorite moment all time Eastman trombone choir was... Um, it was my freshman year and we went to DC. We played at the Eastern Trombone Workshop, now the American Trombone Workshop. But we played there and then the next, I think it was the next day, um, we went and played at the National Cathedral in DC. And we played, um, we played Passacaglia and Fugue in, was it C minor? C minor, yeah. With an organ in this cathedral. So imagine, you know, 30, not, not 30, more like 18 to 20 trombones plus pipe organ. That building was shaking. It was pretty epic. That was a fun, that was a fun moment in trombone choir history. But um, in terms of trombone solos, if you're talking about uh, classical rep, one of my favorite jazz, not jazz, it's not jazz at all. One of my favorites is... Um, Barat, the composer B-A-R-A-T. Well, one of my favorite solo pieces, solo rep trombone is um, this Barat Andante and Allegro. I actually wrote a piece that kind of adapts the harmony from that to a jazz setting on my first record. So my first record is called um, Exposition and there's a tune on there called Eventide. And on that tune, uh, I stole straight up, just let's be, on, uh, let's be uh, honest, I just stole it. <laughs> stole the har harmony uh, for it and put a new melody to it and, and stuff like that. So um, anyway, you can check that out. If you listen to the Barat and then you listen to Eventide, you'll, you'll hear the harmony uh, moving in a similar kind of way against a, against a bass note, a, ba a bass note, against a, a bass pitch, perhaps. How cutthroat is the trombone scene in New York? Is there camaraderie? Is it every man for themselves? Been talking with a couple of colleagues up there, just curious your opinion. Man, I guess it depends who you're talking about. There are some people that are only out for themselves, but in my experience, everyone has been more than happy to help and everyone has been mostly positive to me. And I think most trombone players are 
into camaraderie and are into helping each other out, I think. Uh, in my in my experience, like I said, not everybody's experience, but in my experience, um, is it competitive? Do you have to play well? Yes. Do you need to take care of business? Yes. Do you need to be on time? Yes. Is it easy to get replaced on a gig? Yes. Uh, do Are people out to get you? No, I don't think so. Um, people want to see you succeed. They want to help out the new person in town, you know. Uh, there's a young trombonist student of Michael Deese's and a guy that I've seen around. He just moved to New York. I'm already, I, you know, I'm trying to send them gigs. If my students move to New York, I try to send them gigs and send them on gigs or at least on rehearsals because that's how you get known on the scene is playing rehearsals mostly, uh, especially for trombone because you get to meet three other trombone players. You're in a big band section and then one thing leads to the next and uh, you get all kinds of different opportunities just from showing up, being professional, playing good, all of it is related, so don't be uh, don't be afraid. The New York trombone scene is very welcoming, especially to great players. Uh, so just take care of business, and you'll be cool. What are questions you always ask professionals? Well, for a long time, I always asked like, how do you replicate the career path that they had? But then I realized that that career the career paths that they had don't exist anymore, and that like the serendipity of the career paths that they had. Say, so I'm just thinking of my teachers, like Wycliffe Gordon, Steve Ture. So Wycliffe Gordon going to school in Tallahassee at Florida A&M and, and Wynton Marcellus comes through to meet him. And it's the right, right place, right time kind of situation. And he's like a very naturally gifted musician. Um, it's a totally different situation than Steve Ture, who is in the Bay Area and goes there and like sits in at Cafe Stritch or was it Cafe Stretch? I don't remember exactly where, but it's not super relevant. You know, and gets like an invitation to come sit in with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers in New York. And I think it was Woody Shaw that came to town and he met Woody Shaw. And then he goes to New York and sleeps on Art Blakey's couch. Like none of those serendipitous things can happen. Like my life has happened at a different time in a different place. And you can't replicate those things. So I've moved away from asking those type of questions. Those are the kind of questions I always wanted to know. Like, what do I do? How, what steps do I follow to do what you did? But the real answer is that nothing that they say about their path, although it is interesting, it is not the way that I'm going to be able to replicate it because it can't be replicated. And it can only be, uh, you can only find it your own path and a new path through um, those situations, in my experience. So like to try to replicate it was something I focused on for a long time, but then uh, I realized like it's not, it's not the game. You can't replicate it. You have to find your own way and your own path and so um, I think, you know, asking them how they've been, how they've developed their own approach to something is an interesting um, or their compositional approach, different things like that. If there's something you don't understand about how they have conceived their musicianship, I think that's one, you know, one to ask. What was the last bad habit you tried to fix? My last bad habit. I have lots of bad habits, like drinking too much coffee. It's already 325. I'm still drinking coffee. I have a bad habit of trying to fix everything if I think it's like not right. I have a bad habit of working all the time. There's a lot, I have lots of bad habits, Taylor. Um, but specifically like trombone wise and music wise, um, specifically I've been trying to get out of the habit of not practicing. I've been digging deep into like, I, I put together, we went through it today in the boot camp. I put together a new warm-up routine with new goals, new mission. Um, I'm recording a new album this summer, so I'm like, I got to get this together. Um, you know, I don't know. So, and so anyway, that's kind of my thing. Like, I'm trying to get back to feeling the progress that I felt like maybe when I was in school, because that was a big moment of growth for me when I was in grad school for those two years or 18 months, whatever it was, to now wanting to get back to that feeling of momentum that I had then is something that I'm trying to get back to. Um, but in terms of bad habits, those are a couple. What am I fascinated with lately? I've been listening to Cal Newport podcast and reading some of his books or audio books and thinking about how to do less um, and just like how, you know, you only have so much bandwidth and you really like every every yes you have you say is like saying no to other things accidentally or like 
on the side. Like you don't get to, you can't just say yes to everything. And there's a diminishing return. The more projects you do, I'm a person that does a lot of things and I have a lot of projects all the time and I do a lot of things and, uh, I need to kind of condense and come back and kind of focus. So I'm a person that does get involved maybe in too many things and too many yeses, and I got to kind of focus in on some stuff. So uh, I'm fascinated with that idea of doing doing less, finding the balance of like how much less should I do in order to get much better at the things that I am doing um, and using my time even more wisely, more effectively. Uh, what activities that I'm doing that are, you know, effective or not effective, et cetera. What was the last record you listened deeply to? What was the last record you listened deeply to? What was your takeaway from it? Probably something that I've been showing students. I mean, and there are certain jazz trombone records that I've listened to so many times. Um, and then I listen to for specific things and I use for like examples of like how to listen or like how to listen deeply um, JJ Johnson in person is one that's like just obvious and for most trombone players, they know that one, they know that record, but, um, or trombone master, it's also called, it's got two names, but, um, other records I've listened to super deeply are Chick Corea, Now I Sings, Now I Sobs and Herbie Hancock, Speak Like a Child. Um, what did I take away from them? Well, with Chick Corea, it was also his birthday yesterday. Uh, so happy, happy late birthday, Chick. With Chick Corea, I, I think there's like this childlike curiosity that he has that's super inspiring. Like, how do you stay um, curious? How do you stay uh, motivated to be curious? Or like, how do you keep approaching the same songs and the same music with that insatiable curiosity he has that and so i've take i take that away from him but now he sings now he sobs is like such a good balance to me of like free playing and form playing and like it's not really free it's not really like straight ahead tunes it's original music but like i don't know there it's some it meets up somewhere in the middle um so that's interesting to me and uh something i've taken away and speak like a child like it's interesting how much they can make out of so little. Like those tunes don't have that much to them, but there's so much music and such interesting choices with arranging, with bass trombone and flute and trumpet. It's like weird. And so, and there's no horn solos, it's all piano solos. So it's just interesting how different people made different choices at different times. And it's interesting that, um, because we don't really make records like that anymore. Like we don't just like, here's some days in the studio, try something. It's like you kind of like plan it all out meticulously in advance because artists are investing in their own projects and it's expensive and you don't do it all the time. And it's a lot of reasons, but like we just don't make records that way. And it makes it that much more interesting to see like, okay, he's just like, oh, let's try this, you know? And so that's how I want to be with my music. Let's try this. But it's like, you know, we're going into the studio making like, what is this? My sixth record with the sextet, sixth record, seventh record, something. And it's like, oh, well, like it has to be good. You know, I'm spending all this money. It has to be good. Right. So we get kind of stuck in this and we don't just like try like, oh, what happened if I just did this? You know, that's how I want to be. But it's hard to be that way. Do you feel like students like curiosity in academia, even outside of academia? What are your thoughts on students that may be don't have the most amount of motivation or curiosity. Like I said, I've been listening to this Cal Newport and he is a, he's also a professor in Georgetown, computer science. So totally unrelated, I don't know, related or unrelated, but um, he talks about, well, and I've also, I'm listening to a bunch of things and talking about like, I've said on this channel many times, like you just decide what you're going to do and you do it. Uh, People bring up quite questions about motivation or I feel unmotivated, how do I get motivated? It's like, well, I don't even think about that. Like I just do the thing. And so explained much more eloquently, it's your identity and you decided like, I am a person who practices or I am a composer, so I write. I am a writer, so I write words, you know? Um, So it's like developing the sense of identity within the habits that you wanna have. My identity as a student is and was that I was a student that did the work and that I would try hard. That was part of my identity. I would be correct. 
You know, I got good grades. That was part of my identity as a person. So the question of motivation wasn't one. The question of curiosity maybe wasn't there either because the question, because I was more like, I'm going to do the right thing, right? And I'm going to check the boxes and I'm going to accomplish X, Y, Z and I'm going to do this, 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 this. And so when I got to a point where I realized that none of the checking of boxes was going to get me to replicate the careers of the people that I wanted to replicate the careers of, then I was kind of like, well, what do I do now? You know, but um, I would say that most students fall into, a lot of them fall into one category, which is like they aren't motivated by anything other than themselves and wanting to do good in school to check the boxes. That's one type of student. There's the other type that doesn't want to be there at all, but wants to be in that career and kind of went to college and like, okay, this is what you do. And they're just kind of there. And then um, there's the ones that really actually are curious about music. And those are the ones that you know that they're going to do great from the beginning because they're invested in the making of music, not in the doing of school. So there's, but there's lots of different, and no one stays on one path and people change. And I'm not saying like one person like is stuck in whatever, however they are when they get to school isn't how they are when they're finished or anything like that. It, but there are these different identities that you might have. Like I, there's definitely people that say, I'm not good at school, but I'm going to go anyway. Right. And it's like, well, that's a self-defeating kind of thing. But that idea is kind of where I, where I would go with this question. Like you have to in terms of motivation and curiosity, it's like, are you, are you that type of person? And if you are, then you will be. And what, and if that's your identity, then you will be uh, curious and you will go beyond what's asked of you and you will learn tunes and you will create your own projects and you will make your own records because you want to participate in the music, you know, favorite activity to do with middle schoolers in an improv class. Yes. I'll give you a good, this is, I get excited. Uh, there's two, um, well, I guess that's one, really. But it's getting away from music and just improvising in general. And so we'll, we've, I've done two activities with my nonprofit, the Institute for Creative Music, that are pretty fun with middle schoolers or even um, elementary school students. So one is playing pictures. So maybe one idea is like uh, drawing maybe dots on the board. Like, what does this sound like? And so maybe it sounds like this. Or like, what does a cloud sound like? A sound cloud, like an improvise a cloud of sound and like, okay, let's pick these notes. You can play any of these notes, but let's like make a cloud, right? And so just improvising and playing music in that way. So it gets away from like, you got to learn the blues and you got to know this scale and you got to do this, 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 this. So I like to do that with middle school and that sort of thing. And then another one that's pretty fun is like, let's write a story and then let's play the story. So like, what does it sound like to, to narrate the story musically? So maybe you pick a character and you write a little, a very simple story, and then you go ahead and you like actually play the story. And it really, it gets the students outside of thinking about the stupid like chord scales and the, not that it's stupid, it's important information, but like it's one, it's one way of playing, right? And it's like, you gotta be a little bit more open-minded and broad, I think sometimes. And so anyway, those are two. I really like doing those. And they usually get excited about it because they've never played that way before. And they're always like have to read the music and play the tune. And anyway, it can be fun, especially the beginning of a camp. Anyway, it has nothing to do with playing to accomplish something for a concert. It has only to do with like enjoying the making of music, you know. Have you ever studied, it says practice the style of modern brass bands like Lucky Chops, that's no BS brass. If I studied it, no. Have I played it? Yes. Have I played with those people? Yes. So yes, I guess, by just playing with them, but not like officially, like studying in some official kind of capacity. But yeah, I was played in a lot of brass bands in New York. I wouldn't say that like I'm the best at it because my my way of approaching the instrument doesn't always translate into the kind of intensity that a lot of those people play with. But I definitely have done it and played did that in college and it's very fun. A name a list of records that you want to listen to but haven't had time to? Oh, man. Well, I don't know, to be quite frank. Like, I check out what's coming out because I also run a record label. So I'm checking out what's coming out. I'm checking out submissions. Um, there are so many records. And I've talked, to, talked about this before, but, like, this generation, the current generation of students, my generation of students, 
exponentially more recordings are available to us than to the generation before, the next generation. Like, because not only do you have, I used to say this about my, when I was in college, like not only do we have all the greats to listen to, but we have all the people um, that are alive now that we want to check out. And then we have our teachers that we want to check out. We have our peers that we want to check out. And now there's another, at least one, if not two generations younger than me. Let's say I'm 30, how old am I? 34. So there's at least two, three generations younger than me. That It's like, you got to check them out. And like, there's so much music. And like anyone, like the students, like, yeah, I want them to listen to JJ and Curtis and all these people. But then you got, and then like, they're listening to my record too. And it's like taking space, you know, like there's not enough space to listen to everything. What would be a gig you start, would say no to? Or if you did take on less work, you would start to say no to? Well, I mean, for me, it was made, I made it pretty clear when I started teaching. Um, I just said no to anything that wasn't music I wanted to play. I would start with things like you got to think about the triangle, right? Like good people, good music, good money. And you got to figure out like it's got to have two. And then if you want to take on less work, like don't take any that are only one, you know, that would be kind of the, the start. But when I started teaching, what I was saying was I decided I wasn't going to play any gigs that were not music I wanted to play or with people that I wanted to play with. And so, but before that, when, when I, what, before I had a teaching job, I just said yes to everything. And so it was pretty stark, you know, it was just a yes, 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 yes. And then all of a sudden I was like, no, 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 yes. No, 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 yes, you know. So, um, and that's a luxury. It's definitely a luxury and it's not, but if I was you, if I was gonna start, start to say no to gigs, it would be free gigs that were not with people you really wanted to play with. Um, but the thing is that you never really know where something might lead. So to, for me to give you a blanket statement, like don't play any free gigs or don't do this, or don't, it's not really good advice, I don't think, because you never know what thing is gonna lead to something else. Um, like for example, and so I, I usually say like, you know, you never know what it's gonna, what something's gonna be. So there was one day where a friend of mine called me his name is mike catone great trumpet player he lives in la now but we're both from rochester and he called me he's like hey can you come do this recording session he pays twenty dollars and he's gonna buy us like a falafel or something and i'm like okay yeah i'm like sure whatever I'm like i don't know who this is i don't know what why mike is calling me whatever and i go and i do it and it's this piano player and he has these arrangements of like pop tunes and I'm like, what is this? Like, okay, like whatever, I don't know. And we record it, and then it turns out to be this, that group called Post Postmodern Jukebox that is still touring and doing so much stuff, right? And I, I had no idea, and I just showed up and did it. And so it's like, you never really know like what's gonna be the thing that like becomes something. And so to make blanket advice is just not good advice, you know? But um, if I was you, DJ, I, I would find the gigs that make you the least happy and so I would stop playing the one, those ones and not so much worry about the ones with music and the ones that have good music you should play those good people you should play those uh anything that seems interesting you should play that regardless of the money but um you know for example an easy gig to say no to is a wedding gig for example with a wedding band because there will be more of those right and I'm not putting those bands down or anything like that it's just like that is like a uh a commodity thing like they don't need you they just need trombone person to stand there right so it's like you could say no to some of them and they'll come back around again there will be another band it's just money right it's like those would be the ones but they're the hardest to say no to because they pay the best right so it's a difficult trap you kind of get stuck in this loop but um you know if you're going to start taking on more arranging work then maybe you don't have to play those gigs for example you know but it's tough. It's hard to start saying no when you've said, it's hard for me to say no still, even though I'm talking about it. Like I have a really hard time saying no, even if it's gonna cost me money to play the gig, playing in New York. Somebody calls me to play in New York and I will spend a thousand dollars to go play these gigs, right? That's crazy. What am I doing? But I do it. What is your favorite music genre? Jazz or whatever that means. Instrumental improvised music. You get to combine two wind instruments into one awesome instrument. Which two are you picking? If you could make a saxophone that sounded like a trombone, like, you know what I mean? Like, a, like you played it with 
the ease of the saxophone, I mean, but like it sounded like a trombone, like that would be pretty, pretty hip. It could be a trumpet too, but like if it could play as easily as, as one of those. So like, I guess it would be a woodwind and a brass combined, I guess. Uh, this guy, a friend plays, we play in the Anako Tentet. James Ship is his name. Great percussionist, vibraphone player. He also does stuff with synths and he like hooked up a vocoder, was it a vocoder or a talk box to, so like his synthesizer to the talk box and then use trombones as trombone bells as the, as amplifiers. I still haven't gotten to check it out, uh, but that's something I'm very interested to know about how it sounds in terms of combining instruments. So that's like a synthesizer and a trombone bell. That seems pretty hip to me. I started playing trombone quite late. How would you deal with feeling slash thought that you have to catch up to everyone else? The thing is that everybody's on their own journey. And so just remembering that like, it's gonna take as long as it takes to get good at the trombone. The trombone is not an easy instrument to master. Uh, I'm not sure that you really ever master it to be quite frank. Um, so thinking about that, like it's not gonna just happen right? And like, it's going to take you a while. And to get really good at anything, it's going to take a long time. So uh, try and be patient with yourself, try and be patient with those around you. Um, but the thing is that the further along you are when you start in terms of your musical concept, in terms of your ability to learn, you're going to be able to learn faster than like, say, you, I started playing trombone in fourth grade, but it's like very slow. You, you don't learn very much for a long time. At least I did not. I just went at the pace of the class I was in, you know. And uh, if you're older and then you start, you learn, what, you know, much, much faster. So um, you're naturally going to be able to learn faster than others. So just stick with it. Don't give up. Trombone's a good instrument. We need more people to put trombones in their music. I hope you're all having a wonderful day. We'll be back next week, uh, Monday, 4 p.m. Eastern, to chat more. But uh, between now and then, be safe and uh, healthy, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll catch you all very soon.